Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin Smith. Tonight, Kenya's president bids ceremonial farewell to hundreds of troops set to head off to Haiti to help tackle gang violence that has pushed the Caribbean nation to the brink of becoming a failed state. Also, nearly a month since South Africa's ANC party lost its parliamentary majority and more of its rivals join its coalition government that's thrust the country into uncharted political territory. And there are already signs that the collaboration may not always make for good bedfellows. And a not so happy city. The Nigerian community of Ayatoro is losing residents and more as parts of it sink into the sea as the ravages of coastal erosion takes its toll. But first, on Monday, Kenya's president, William Ruto, headed up a send-off ceremony for 400 police officers set to lead a UN-backed mission to Haiti. Now, the deployment will be helping tackle gang violence in the Caribbean nation, but Nairobi's initial offer to send 1,000 police to support the mission has attracted criticism at home, and opposition parties launched several legal bids to try and block it. Despite this, though, the first forces are due to head out to Haiti on Tuesday. Our regional correspondent tells us more. It's now official, 400 Kenyan policemen will fly to Haiti on Tuesday. Kenya's president, William Ruto, held a ceremony this Monday. He handed over a Kenyan flag to the group. It's a tradition in Kenya when policemen or soldiers are sent abroad. And then he held a prayer for them. Uh, these policemen will lead a multinational uh, mission in Haiti to fight gang violence in the country. It's been approved by the United Nations Security Council, and it's financed by several other countries countries, including the United States and France. Listen to Kenya's president, William Ruto. He explains why it's important for Kenya to lead this mission. As a nation, our commitment to fundamental values knows no borders. And we are called upon to extend the reach of peace as part of our moral, pan-African, multilateral, and humanitarian obligation as a people and as a nation. This mission is one of the most urgent, important, and historic in the history of global solidarity. For months, Kenya's president has been pushing to organize this deployment. But a small opposition party, the Sudway Alliance uh, Kenya, has been filing lawsuits to uh, stop him. Uh, its leader, a lawyer called uh, Ekuru Aukert, uh, says that the deployment is unconstitutional. Several human rights organizations also uh, said that they are skeptical about the deployment. They say that uh, policemen are misbehaving in Kenya. They're afraid of uh, the consequences of their deployment in Haiti. But it's important to act as fast as possible, said William Ruto. Since the beginning of the year, uh, thousands of civilians have been either uh, killed, injured or kidnapped uh, by the gangs in Haiti. Now, the EU has slapped sanctions, including an asset freeze and a travel ban on six people linked to the escalation of Sudan's war between the army and the RSF paramilitary. Now, the listing includes the RSF's financial advisor and a general accused of instigating ethically motivated killings and sexual violence in West Darfur, the director of defense industry systems and the commander of the Sudanese Air Force have also been targeted over indiscriminate bombing of residential areas. In South Africa's ANC, the party heading up the awkwardly cobbled together government of national unity has slammed some of its coalition partners for demanding cabinet positions. Now, the GNU so far has 10 parties in total after more former opposition parties joined over the weekend. And Wenzel brings us more. The ANC continues to gain Government of National Unity partners. This weekend, they announced that more parties have joined the GNU, including another two parties that originally joined the EFF-led Progressive Caucus, which was meant to be a working body that stood against the Government of National Unity as an opposition body and also united in their antipathy 
for the former opposition party, the DA. The GNU now consists of 10 parties, including the ANC and DA, and covers over 70% of the votes cast in the national general election held on 29 May. But the ANC says it is still talking to partners who have not joined the GNU. The ANC has not publicly commented on the issue around the DA's MP, Ronaldo Chaus, who is being taken to the Equality Court for hate speech following the resurfacing of a video he made some 10 years ago using the N-word and the K-word to describe black people and saying they should be killed. Over the weekend, another DA member, also sworn in as a member of parliament, Ian Cameron, was exposed as having been part of a protest in 2012 while wearing blackface. The DA has yet to deal with the issue of hosts, which they say will be dealt with at a disciplinary hearing. Meanwhile, former President Jacob Zuma's MK party members who boycotted the 14 June parliamentary session and swearing in of new MPs into the legislature are said to be sworn in at 12 tomorrow. Parliament has confirmed that all flight and accommodation logistics have been finalised and there is no indication from the MK party that it will not attend. Now, break down there from Anne Ventsel for us. Now, businesses in parts of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania shut up shop as an indefinite strike kicked off on Monday, commercial hotspots like Kariaku Market were closed as traders try to pressure the government to scrap certain service and government levies. Some also accuse authorities of harassing them by seizing their goods and refusing to accept receipts and financial statements showing that traders are operating above board. Some traders' unions, though, have refused to support the industrial action, saying that the government's already started to engage with some of their complaints. And more than 20 people have been killed in a massacre in eastern DR Congo, in the province of Ituri. Rival militia groups have been waging conflict in the province for years now. Our Emmett Livingston brings us more. Militia massacres carried out late last week in the Jugu territory of eastern Congo's Ituri province have claimed over 20 lives, according to local sources. The attacks were reportedly carried out in villages on June the 21st and 22nd by fighters from the Kodeko militia, one of the region's most deadly groups, which claims to represent the ethnic Lendu community. The exact death toll remains unclear, with some officials referring to over 20 dead and others suggesting that nearly twice that number had been killed. Houses were also torched in the attack and people kidnapped. Since late 2017, a conflict between the Lendu and Hema communities has raged in Ituri province, with both the Kadeko militia and its rival, the Zaire militia, engaging in tit-for-tat attacks in which civilians often pay the price. The latest massacre in Ituri has come after several militias signed a government-brokered peace agreement on April 26th, which now appears to have broken down. It also follows a series of massacres in the region this month, committed by the Allied Democratic Forces Group, which is affiliated to the Islamic State. One person has been killed and dozens of others were injured in a stampede at a re-election rally for Rwandan President Paul Kagame. The crash happened in Rubavu in the west as attendees tried to get closer to him. Official campaigning for the next month's election began over the weekend and Kagame, who's run the country since 1994, is widely expected to be returned to office once more. Since Niger's coup last July, humanitarian organisations that rely on international financial backing have found the going tough. Some have had to cut back on their work as funding trickles away. Others have shut down completely. The most vulnerable are hit by this. And the situation is expected to get worse as the existing food crisis, the worst in a decade, is set to peak this month. Our team tells us more. Niger's military rulers still welcome humanitarian aid, even from Western countries that they have been fiercely criticizing over the last year. This man works for an NGO that offers support to farmers in the region. Its work is funded by the EU and the US. This aid from USAID and the European Union is significant. It plays a huge role in our work. When this aid is cut, everything falls apart. We go to meet some of the program's beneficiaries. Some have taken part in a course offering training about off-season farming. 
It's useful, but was stopped earlier than expected due to a lack of resources. Honestly, this NGO has helped us a lot. They provided us with motor pumps, gas, seeds and work equipment. We're very grateful. But today, with the lean season starting and our reserves running out, we need more assistance. Since last year, the rains have been scarce and we're facing a severe water shortage. The EU has pledged over 24 million euros in humanitarian aid to Niger this year. Some blame the shortages on the political, diplomatic and economic turbulence that followed last year's coup. In Niger, the cost of humanitarian aid is rising due to the closure of the border with Benin. We also struggle because the EU has cut off budgetary support. More than 4 million people in Niger are thought to currently need humanitarian aid. Many more could be added to the number if the main humanitarian corridor through Benin remains closed amidst the diplomatic standoff between the neighbors. Well, the Nigerian community of Ayatoro is threatened by ongoing coastal erosion. This seaside town was built in 1947 and was once nicknamed the Happy City. But today, many of its buildings have sunk into the sea and are in ruins. Meanwhile, residents are in despair, saying that there's little being done to try and save their homes. Clem Vala tells us more. As waves crash along the shore of this Nigerian seaside town, residents are in distress. This once vibrant coastal city now lies in ruins, slowly drowned by the ocean. Victoria Arowolo has lived in Ayetoro her whole life. The retired civil servant has had to move three times as waters continue to claim land. More than two thirds of Ayetoro has been claimed by this sea erosion. Where we are is a new settlement. The old Ayetoro has been taken away by the sea. And if you look where the sea is now, that is the end of the former Ayetoro. Due to years of coastal erosion, buildings have collapsed, pushing the community further inland. Ayetoro is located within the Mahin Mud Coast, which has lost nearly 60% of its land to the ocean over the last 30 years. For this professor, more study is needed to completely understand what is happening to the community's natural landscape. And there is a need to really understand the marine processes that is actually occurring. As you can see, in this environment, we have the ocean surge, and also we have erosion, and at the same time, there are flooding from time to time. For scientists, there are many factors at play, including mangrove deforestation, climate change and underwater oil drilling. Earlier this year, the Ondo state government announced a commitment to finding lasting solutions to the threat to Ayetoro. However, for residents and the professor, these measures may be arriving too late to be effective. Well, that's it for Eye on Africa for now. Thanks very much for joining us, though, and do so again if you can. Till then, take care. Many mixed-race children born to American GIs and Japanese women were abandoned and stigmatized after World War II. They would throw stones at us or tell us to leave the country. This trauma never really goes away. Uh, it's just surrealistic. You're trying to put two and two together and you don't, you've lived your whole life not knowing. But difficulty fitting in gradually subsides. People's impressions are a barrier sometimes. There was hatred everywhere. But that is in the past. What is that? Oiso's Orphans Revisited on France 24 and France24.com.
France 24, your window on the world. Liberté, égalité, actualité.